Well, hi guys, welcome uh, tonight to our, in our Pass It On program that we're doing with uh, Kathy Nielsen and the Napa Valley Genealogical Society in honor of the American Library Association's National Preservation Week. I know that preserving history is something that's important to all of us, so we're very excited about this presentation tonight. It will be recorded, as I said, and available on the Napa County Library YouTube channel by next week. So check it out either by going on YouTube or go to the Napa County Library website, and there will be a link to our YouTube channel. Just admitting a few more people here. There we go. All right, so like I said, I'm Tess from Napa County Library. I will be moderating this evening. Uh, as you're joining, we ask that you please mute yourselves so that we can reduce uh, background noise and distraction. If you do have any questions or comments during the presentation, that's great, but we ask that you either type them in the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen, or along the bottom, if you see there's a reactions button, you can press that and raise your hand. Then after the presentation, I will go through the questions in order and we'll make sure that we get those answered, okay? So with all of that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark and Sally Perkins, the vice presidents of the Napa Valley Genealogical Society to hear a few words about their library resources. Wonderful. Thank you, Tess. And thank you to you and, and to the Napa County Library for inviting our society to participate in these preservation week activities. Um, and to that end, we're very pleased to be the sponsors for tonight's talk with Kathy Nielsen. Before I introduce Kathy, I'd like to share my screen and provide a little, a brief overview of some of the resources we have at Napa Valley Genealogical Society. Consider this like the short before the, the feature presentation. Okay, so share screen. The Napa Valley Genealogical Society was founded in 1974 and our mission statement is there on the bottom. And you see it includes preservation of family history and also sharing knowledge through workshops and educational programs. For many years, we were, we were nomads. We either met in people's homes or in rented spaces. But in 1991, we had a very important event. And I'm going to turn now the narration over to Sue Zimski, who is on our board of directors, and she's just going to do a brief overview of the organization, starting with the, um, the acquisition of our library. Sue? Uh, this is the genealogy library as it stands today. It's at the corner of Menlo Avenue and California Boulevard. And it's very distinctive. You can see right there that um, this used to be the front door. The front door is now around the corner to the left. This um, is a plaque that was placed there and it's dedication to when the building was purchased in 1991. This provided to us by the native sons of the Golden West. So we've been in operation for quite some time. This is Sammy. And when Sammy is outside the front door, that means that we are open. We do have limited hours, Wednesdays and the first and third Saturday of each month, we're open from 10 to one. We are doing a special open house on the 30th this Saturday, and we invite your community members and people to come in and see what we offer in the way of preservation. We have scanning equipment. We're going to do a demonstration of a new program available through Ancestry on reserve, preserving your photographs directly to Ancestry. So there'll be a lot of things coming on um, to you can try and a lot of uh, presentations of examples of how to preserve some of the things that you may have at home. We suggest that you bring a memory stick so you can download the items that you maybe want to scan. This is just an overview of what our library looks like. Um, we have these maps on the lower right hand side. We have a lot of ancient antique maps. We have a approximately 9,000 volumes of different resources and research materials. 
This is another view of our stack. And this is kind of like the main research center. You can sit here and do your research, bring your computer if you need to. We use the Dewey Decimal System um, here um, as many, many libraries do. And there's one section of the Dewey Decimal System that is dedicated just to genealogical subjects by state. We have items from every state in the union and many other countries available for research at our facility. This is the research center. We have five computers that are available to be used and we offer many um, subscription services that you're free to use when you come in and do your research at the library. We ask that if you're not a member, you leave, give us a, a, a nominal donation to help costs cover the cost of the electricity. If you're a member, of course, it's free to use whenever the library is open. This is our scanning section. We have, um, it's in a separate room, a small office, so it's nice and quiet, and um, it gives you a chance to concentrate on what you're doing. And on Saturday, if you want to bring some of your photographs, we'll make somebody available to help you do some scanning. Um, one of the smaller scanners, the Snap Scan, does photographs, and you can just stick a whole bucket of photographs in there, and it'll just scan them just instantaneously. It makes really good digital copies, but you do want to save it to your stick. And Ancestry has this new mobile app technology that we're going to be demonstrating and talking about Saturday. Um, and it's one of the demonstrations that'll be performed. Uh, this is one of the resources for archival supplies for preservation. Gaylord is covered, has everything you can ever need to do preservation of your items. And the nice thing is if you sign up, which is free to sign up, um, you'll get emails when things go on sale. So this was uh, just a reminder that your ancestors count on you to remember them and your descendants count on you to preserve them. Thank you, Sue. And our website is I on the bottom that, left. Um... Okay, that's the warm up. Now we're looking forward to uh, listening to Kathy Nielsen, she spoke to our society in February. Uh, the title of her talk then was Every Home Has a Story. And uh, we enjoyed it so much, we invited her to come back. <laughs> Kathy is a reference librarian in the California History Room at Monterey Public Library. She has master's degrees in history and library science. Kathy is a popular genealogy speaker on the Monterey Peninsula, and she combines skills as a historian, a storyteller, and a librarian with her love for travel to ma and making family histories come alive. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, Kathy. Thank you, Mark. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So today I'm gonna to talk about passing it on, how to preserve our family history for future generations. And as I was putting this talk together, um, I was hoping that something that I say tonight will inspire you in some way. I'm gonna just throw out lots of tips and tricks and hopefully you'll walk away with maybe one idea that you'd like to pursue. So, You've been, and I've been, the keepers of the stories and the memories. And these are the boxes in my garage. Let's see here, just a moment. So maybe these things were lovingly passed on down to you. Maybe you were the one that sold the family home and packed up the basement or the garage or the attic. And then you move these items over to your basement, garage, or attic. And that would be my situation. <laughs> um, so slowly, over time, I've been trying to go through these boxes, find a home for them, pass them on, 
and preserve those that seem to be of really special value. So now it's our time to deal with all this. So what are the reasons? Why are we doing this? Well, maybe you're downsizing. And that's a, 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 an obvious reason. You need to get rid of stuff. You need to get rid of the clutter. Maybe you've just had it with the clutter. I know when I go into my garage, sometimes I just say, this is it. I just, I can't take this anymore. And then maybe your kids or your nieces or your nephews or your younger cousins are minimalists like our millennial children. They just don't have the same emotional attachment to the things that we consider family treasures. In some cases, it may be because they don't really know the people that these treasures were attached to. Uh. Um, but in any case, they don't really have a desire to carry on the tradition that we've had. So this is not what we want. We don't want those boxes in the garage to go directly into the trash. We want them to go somewhere where they'll be appreciated. And we don't want this either. Um, and sometimes I know we all feel this like, oh my goodness, how, how can I deal with this? So tonight we're gonna talk about some, some opportunities that you have to pass on your treasures. So the process, let's talk about the process. Well, first, don't let all that research you've done about your family history and those precious heirlooms that you have become a burden to you or to your family. Just keep telling yourself, you control the stuff. The stuff does not control you. You control the stuff. Sometimes working on a family member's possessions may bring up emotions and the dynamics of a relationship. So that's something that, that you need, we all need to address and it, to take time as we go through um, the, the information and the heirlooms that we have. We're letting go of the past and we need to get rid of the guilt of giving things away because if we keep everything, we're not gonna be able to live in our houses. We'll feel better, and I found this for myself, if I'm able to pass it on to someone who might appreciate it, enjoy it, and use it. And then I feel like it's okay. So part of this process is finding a place to pass these things on. And just keep telling yourself, you can't save everything. We just don't have the place to save everything. And our families won't want to save everything that we're passing on. So we're the stewards and the caretakers of our family history. And it's our responsibility in some way to organize the research that we've done about our family that we've been very excited about and to make a place for those heirlooms that we've collected. So we need to discard or give away what we don't want. And we need to preserve what we wanna keep. And we'll talk a little bit about ways to preserve some of these special things. In a sense, we're creating or curating a family legacy for our family. We're putting it together to tell a story that will be passed on to our descendants. We're sharing that story with others. So that as the caretakers of our family history, that's our responsibility to try and pull it together in some meaningful way. So what is your family legacy? Well, what, what, what all do you have? And, and probably some of you will identify with some of these things that, that I have in, in our family. The research that you've done, if you have, are a genealogist and you've been putting things together, you have a lot of research in boxes and binders and folders. So that's part of your legacy, what you have spent time doing and researching. And that includes family papers, documents, special recipes from family members, all the photos that we have, the scrapbooks, the home movies, the audio tapes, that's all part of our family legacy. And then we've got the heirlooms and we may have pieces of furniture in our house or, or little knickknacks, kitchen utensils that were special and, and bring back memories. Some of you may be quilters and have some of the quilts from other generations in your family. I have my wedding dress still, I have my baptismal dress. 
You may have a military uniform. You may have framed pictures that are very special that are on the wall. You may have artwork that's been done by a member of your family. And then there are tools and jewelry and watches. Uh, I bet quite a few of you have family watches. So these are all part of our family legacy. So what we wanna do is get rid of the clutter and organize those things that are precious to us. And if we can't keep those things, find another home for them. So Marie Kondo, and I get a kick out of her, and some of you may have read her book uh, when it came out a while ago, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. She left me with, with a couple of thoughts. She said, keep the things that have a function. If you're using them, keep them by all means. But she said also, keep the things that bring you joy. They may not have a function, but they make you smile. And she said that these things will almost reach out to you and um, say, keep me, keep me. And I, I got a kick out of that. And then she says, find another home for the rest. So this, these words of wisdom keep coming back to me. And if you haven't watched some of her YouTube videos, they're, 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 her process is interesting. The other thing is think like an archivist. We're curating a collection. It is a collection of our family's papers and our family's physical belongings. So give that collection a little bit of a cachet. Call it something that will make it seem really important, like the Nielsen Family Collection or the Nielsen Family Archive. So when the kids uh, ask, what have you been up to, Mom? Well, I'm working on the Nielsen Family Archive right now. So it becomes really important. It's an important part of your life and it will become an important part of theirs. Of course, they listen to the stories. They've all, they've been hearing them for years, but let your family know that this is an important collection that you're putting together and that you hope will have some meaning for them. At least not, maybe not now when they're in the midst of all the things that they're doing, but down the road. So your goal is to organize and preserve those special gems, those treasures that are part of your family's legacy and to get rid of those things that are clutter. Okay, so how are we gonna do all this? <laughs> well, let's start with the physical papers and the documents. And um, this is a, a, a desk that one would not want. Oh, I, wa I did wanna say one thing about this picture. Um, this is taken at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I was meeting with the archivist librarian there and researching my revolutionary family, and she was pulling out archival boxes of people who have given things to the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Several generations ago, people have given this organization their research so that when I came along, I was able to benefit from it. So the, we're gonna talk a little bit about finding a home for some of your research. And this is definitely, and I'm gonna unfortunately have to go through this again. Okay, so now we wanna to get to papers and documents. You want your research received with respect. We've spent a lot of time on it and we've, it's brought us a lot of pleasure and we wanna pass it on. There's nothing worse than boxes of papers, folders, photos that don't have a system of some kind. And we've all encountered that. What do you do with it? You don't know where to start. So it's our responsibility, I think, to put these together in some kind of order so they will be received with respect. If it's all thrown in a box, it's an invitation for a family member to just throw it out. My husband's uh, father wrote um, some beautiful books and we're very pleased to have these books. But the research that went into it were in a number of boxes. And when we were deciding what to do with this, we couldn't figure out his system or what, what had meaning. And it would have been really helpful if he had perhaps identified some kind of system. In any case, we have his books and we're grateful for that. Okay, so start with your personal family papers. And these are the things that we all have um, that we've saved for one reason or another. We have letters, we have newspaper clippings, we have photos. We may be really lucky to have a diary or a journal. We probably have yearbooks. 
Um, and we may be very lucky to have the family Bible. And ephemera, ephemera are things like theater tickets, a poster, a napkin, things that weren't meant to last for very long, but they have some kind of um, special emotional um, significance. So these are the personal things that we have that are part of our family legacy. And then we've got those things that we've organized while we've been researching our family. And we probably have a paper copy of a census or a digital copy, voter registration, directories, maps, deeds, wills, newspapers, local histories. These are all documents that have helped us put the story of our ancestors together. So we combine these with the other things that we've inherited from the family that have been passed on down. So we have two things that we're organizing. So we have to decide what we want to keep what we're going to digitize, and what we're going to toss. Well, I feel like the primary source material, that's the original material. That's if we're lucky to have birth, marriage, or death certificates, or a graduation diploma, or baptismal papers, diaries, photos. Those are pretty special. And my suggestion is that you try and hold on to those and organize them in some fashion so they'll make sense for your family. Some examples are the photo that I have up here on the left. Um, the the uh, document on the right is a diary written by my Michigan um, circuit rider uh, uh, minister who would go to small towns in Michigan and um, marry and um, baptize. And he kept a diary of these little towns that he visited. Um, that's pretty special. And that's his handwriting. So that I definitely want to keep. Uh, and then this, the last one is a marriage certificate. So those are things that, that we want to preserve in some way, or at least pass them on to a, a repository that will preserve them. Now, the secondary sources are the compiled sources. Those would be local histories, uh, things that have been put together that are not actually the original things. So do we need to keep those? Maybe we can pass those on. Maybe we can digitize them. Those are things that, that we can, if it's, if it's speaking to us and is important, of course we keep it, but we can at least consider perhaps not keeping all those. So what might we want to get rid of or scan? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the boxes, you know, the things that we acquire from family members. There may be church and club newsletters. Well, unless it actually mentions our family, do we need to keep those? But we probably need to go through, as historians, as, and as genealogists, we are historians, uh, we might wanna go through and get a feel for the time and the period and um, the community that our ancestors lived in. But we don't necessarily need to keep the physical pay, newsletter. We're probably gonna come across canceled checks and check registers and bank statements well, we definitely want to go through those because there may be some big ticket items that will give insights into our family, um, but we don't need to keep those. Now, newspaper and magazine clippings can be really significant. If we do keep them, you know, there's a lot of acid in newspaper and magazine clippings. And if we put them with other documents, they may um, cause damage to those other documents. So if we keep them, which we certainly may, we need to put them in um, polyvinyl chloride sleeves, those, those plastic sleeves to protect them. But we may not need, we may just want to scan them and not keep them. And now, of course, with uh, newspaper um, subscriptions, we have access to all kinds of, of articles um, which are online. Travel itineraries and brochures. My parents traveled later in life and they just had boxes of, of their travels. And it was wonderful to look through them and to remember the trips that they came back so excited about. But do we need to keep them? They're out of date. Um, do they, are they really of relevance to, um, to what we're doing about the family? Oh, calendars, we'll probably find those. Definitely wanna go through and get the important dates. Receipts, again, like, uh, canceled checks. There may be big ticket items that might be interesting. Medical bills and records can give us insights into our own medical history. So that is definitely something that we want to keep, uh, to look at and decide whether it's worth keeping. And then perhaps insurance policies or other documents might be something that we would like to look at, but not, maybe not necessarily to keep.
So these are all the kinds of things that are in these boxes that we don't really need to carry with us into our life. So let's talk about, as genealogists, how we organize our paper. Uh, genealogists largely do this through by the couple. And then when the children grow up, we have another folder or section for that couple. But you may have a really famous person and you might wanna organize your papers around that individual. And that would be certainly a way to do it. And also you might wanna organize them around location. And the reason why I say that is because we're gonna be talking about how you wanna pass these papers on. And the location is really significant. I have family in Westfield, New Jersey. I intend to pass on some of the things I have to the historical society there. I want to organize all my Westfield, New Jersey family because they're not going to be interested in my Monterey family or my Southern California family. They're going to be interested only in the Westfield. So as you're organizing your papers to pass on, you want to actually organize it by location. And then too, you might want to do it by uh, uh, year uh, chronologically. So you work out what works best for you. Um, I use two things. I use, um, and, and this is the binders folder um, question. I use, I have my family groups in binders by couple. So these are the things that I do not want to throw out. The baptismal certificate, the marriage certificate, an important photo. These are the original sources that I don't want to get rid of. These are the things I put in the box when we were evacuated. And you and Napa can appreciate this too. Um, when we were all evacuated during the fires a couple of years ago, binders go in the box in the car. These folders are things that I'm currently working on um, that I'm putting into my software. And um, I've just, I've come back from a trip. I've got something on these people and I'm getting ready to put them in my binder. So figure out what system works for you. We all, we all have to come up with something that works for us. Another thing is to be aware of the provenance of your papers. Now, what is that? That's the, who created them where they originated, who owned it. And as an archivist, this is a very important thing to consider because it is about how things are organized, how the collector put things together. So our relatives curated photos in an album and they put it in an album in a way to tell a story. They created that organization. So as we're looking at papers, Think about how the organization they created help you tell the story. So you wanna try and keep things that are related together. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, it is tempting to take a photo album apart if you want a particular picture. Really look at that album and see if there is a provenance to it, if there is a story connected with it. And then maybe it's best to scan it and take the things apart by scanning. This is an example of, I shared this with uh, the Napa uh, Genealogical Society uh, a couple of months ago. This is a beautiful example of provenance. This is my grandmother. She went to the Chestnut Wood Business School in Santa Cruz, 1897. Um, my brother, just a side story, a couple of months ago, cleared out his attic and brought over seven more boxes. And I, and I said, Bill, Please, you know, let's, I, I'm trying to deal with the boxes I have. But this wonderful little ledger was in one of those boxes. And I said, this is, it was worth it for this. This is a ledger that she had at school in which she did bookkeeping. And it is marked by the Chestnut Wood Business School. It was something that she had. It is dated. When she graduated, she used it as a photo album. And she started to put together pictures of the family home and the story behind, beside her family home. The family home was in Prunedale, uh, north of Monterey. And so this I do not want to take apart at all. This is the, her ledger. This is something she used in school. And these are the stories of her family and her home. So this is something definitely to scan. And this is a provenance. This is the way she put her story together. 
This is another example. This is a postcard album. You can see faded up their postcards. Maybe some of you have these. This is a turn of the century postcard album owned by my great grandmother who got postcards from her kids as they traveled. The lower right is Colton Hall in Monterey. The lower left is Salinas. Up above is uh, Shasta, the Sacramento River. Pasadena's on the upper, upper left, upper right is Pasadena. On the back are the posts, the messages that were written to their mother. This is the story of this family's travels. I don't wanna take this apart either, but I can scan it. Other examples of provenance are, besides a photo album, are letters that might be bound together with string. You wanna get rid of that string because that may have um, uh, damage uh, the letters or the envelopes if they're in. Um, a scrapbook of newspaper clippings, baby and wedding albums, journals, diaries, business records. These are all examples of the story that is, was told by someone who put this together. So you've got these physical family papers whether in a scrapbook or individual papers, and you decide to keep them. We do not want to store them in the basement, the garage, or the attic for very long because papers are so sensitive to a change in degrees, 65 to 70 degrees is a couple um, uh, uh, temperature for, for our documents. When you go into an archival um, uh, library or, or archives, you'll notice that sometimes it's kind of chilly in there. And that's because they're keeping the temperature down to keep the documents preserved. So if you are going to keep these precious things at home, um, try and put them in a, a closet, a dark room, under the bed is a good place for them. And just be conscious of light, heat, dust, and bugs because they do do damage. And then the other thing is, if you're keeping them at home, use archival materials. Sue talked about Gaylord. Um, yes, there are a number of companies where you can buy the archival materials will help you preserve these things. And you generally wanna store them flat because if they are um, a scrapbook, uh, if you put it on the binding, it's gonna be hard on the binding. These are sheet protectors that I talked about. Um, they're acid-free. Uh, lignum free means that there was, that's the cell, cellular walls of plants. And if that's attaching, touching some of your documents, it can also damage it. These are just things to think about as you're preserving your family, family papers. And again, Gaylord is um, uh, uh, one often used by libraries. Hollinger is used by libraries. Archival products and methods. These are all um, good places to get your archival supplies. And if you are keeping them, um, it is a good idea to do this. If you have visited a library, you know the librarian will bring out the archival box and um, that's preserving the papers the library has. Okay, so now your physical papers are organized and now you're considering digitizing them. So you wanna scan your physical papers and family items. You wanna get rid of the paper documents that no, you no longer need to keep, get them out of the house, get rid of them. You want to organize your digital copies in some way because you're telling a story. Remember, we don't just want to have our family come in and say, what is all this? And you want to organize them on your computer. Perhaps you use a software. Or organize them online in one of the subscription sites. You want to put your family research together in a way that you will share it with your family or, in many cases, the world. I use um, a software. Um, there are many, many softwares and you can just Google genealogy software. This is Reunion 13, but um, there's Legacy, there's Roots Magic, there's uh, Family Tree. Um, there is just uh, a number, there's eight to 10 different uh, ways to, to sort your information. But what this does for me is puts the story together in one place. All the research that I do, I put into my software. I do also put things online, but this is my main source. Now, the great thing about software is that you can turn your software into a book. You can make a PDF of all of this research, your documents, your photos, and it will be come out in a PDF and you can publish, self-publish it as a book. So it is a good way to pass on the research that you've done. 
your kids, your family may not want to learn this software, but it's a way for you to keep it together and then for you perhaps to put it in some form of a book. Um, the books that I've created for my family, um, I've said to my kids, you're not going to throw out this book, are you? And they said, oh, no, 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 mom, we won't do it. Um, I think that there's something about a book that maybe a member of your family wrote that you're not going to throw it out. You're going to honor it. So consider uh, this as a way of creating a book in an easy way, an easy format. Of course, you can always publish your own book too. And that um, that's really appreciated by the family as well. So one way that you also can get your information out to the world beyond your own computer, beyond the book, beyond the software, is to have it with an online subscription company. And these are the big four, Ancestry, My Heritage, Family Search, and Find My Past. Ancestry, My Heritage, and Find My Past are subscription based. Family Search is totally free. So family search is something to consider. Subscription sources, um, you know, I, I know we use, we use subscription sources to make contact with other cousins to get more information. They're really important in our genealogy research. But remember that you can only access that information if you're on the internet. And if your internet is down or you're, in an area where you don't have internet, you don't have access to that research you've done. Whereas if you've got your computer um, and your software, you still have that information to work with. The other thing is that you've got to maintain a subscription and our, our family's gonna to wanna to continue paying for that subscription after we're gone. Um, so it is a great tool, but just think about the, uh, the other options. Companies, are likely to be purchased, change hands. Ancestries changed hands three times in the last 10 years. And very likely when they change hands, their mission may change a little bit. So just be aware of subscription services and how you can't rely totally on them. Family Search, I think, is an exception because it is free. It's connected to the Church of Latter-day Saints. And it's very likely to maintain its mission for a long time. And it's very committed to family history. And one of the things I like about family search is it does have a collaborative tree and you can just add your information to this and it will go on and it will not have to be paid for. It will be up there. Collaborative tree is a group of people with the same ancestors bringing their information together. If you want your own research separate then you need to also consider their pedigree resource file. And that's a way you can upload your own information from your software to their site and it won't be touched. It won't be in collaboration. So they have two ways of, of loading your information, a collaborative tree and your own specific research. And I do, I do recommend that you look at that as a way to preserve what you've done and to get it out there and share it with the world. It's also a very nice way to connect with cousins that you didn't know you had. So you wanna share your research with your family. And once your physical collection is digitized, what I've done and tried to do is put the things about a family unit on a flash drive and send it off to them. So my Niels, the Nielsen family or my Anderson, my maiden name, those cousins who would be interested in those pictures, those stories, I've put them on a flash drive and I said here, so that they're not only in my house, that I am sharing them and they're out there for my, I'm passing it on to my family. The second picture is a self-published book, which I did with my software. We had a family reunion in New Zealand. I put together all the research I had done, the photos, the documents in a PDF, pressed the button on my software and then had it published and took it to New Zealand. I also put it on a flash drive so that the family had it. So what we wanna do is not just keep that research in our house, but we wanna get it out to our family and to the world. Also, I've been looking at creating a digital archive and there are three possibilities that I really like that I've explored 
permanent.org, forever.com, collectionaire.com. And I'll look at, we'll look at that in just a minute. So even if no one in your family is interested right now, your information will be posted online for future reference in some way. And a book will be on the shelf in case someone is interested. And that flash drive will be in someone else's home to add to their computer. So it's about passing it on, getting our, the, the precious things that we have and getting it to other members of our family. Someone down the line will be interested. So, oh, you might say, I don't have family. My kids aren't interested. Um, so I say, share your source family family story with the world. Don't limit it just to your family. Get it out there. So you post on subscription sites. You get information to local libraries. You get information to local historical and genealogical societies. You send your information to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Allen County Public Library, state libraries and archives, college or university special collections, and the Library of Congress. And, I'm, and I wanna go into each of these just a little bit and let you know that they are all welcoming the research that we've done. Let's look at the public library first. Um, Tess and I were talking about the Napa County Library. The Napa County Library does have a local, local history collection and they do collect things that are relate to Napa County. Now that doesn't mean that they would want necessarily our family trees because that goes over to the genealogical society, but they are interested in things that we have that have to do with Nap Napa County. My library, the Monterey Public Library, has a California room, and it collects written, visual, and audio, audio, audible materials um, that are created by and about the residents of Monterey area, both past and present. So people uh, write the library and say, we have this in the library, says, yes, that's within our scope or not within our scope. Um, so you really need to connect with the institution to see if they would like what you have. Now, the local historical and genealogical societies, the Napa Valley is dedicated to the promotion of genealogical, historical, and biographical research. And I understand they have an incredible vertical file based on surnames. So if you have information about your family, please get in touch with Mark and Sue and the people at the genealogical society. The historical society also is intent on keeping the history of the people who have lived in Napa County. I have family that went to Kingsburg down near Fresno, um, my Swedish family, and there is a, a historical society down there. And I did write a book uh, on my Swedish family. This is my brother and myself standing on the land in North Dakota where my family first immigrated and then they moved to Kingsburg. And I contacted them and I said, I've written the story of my Swedish family that came to Kingsburg. And they said, we would love it. We would love that book. So it's on the shelves now for anyone who comes in and is looking at um, the immigration of, 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 of a Swedish family. And perhaps other members of my family will discover this book there. The Family History Library in Salt Lake City will take family histories digitally or, or they'll digitize it for you or they will take um, the, the actual physical uh, information that you have. So think about them as a place to send your information. The Allen County Public Library will take anything. They are amazing. I, it's the a genealogy center. I wrote in the elevator with Kurt Witcher at Roots Tech, which is the big conference in Salt Lake City, annual conference. He's head of this. And I said, Kurt, is it really true that you take anything? And he said, yes, we take anything. He said, in fact, in the dead of night, people will drop off boxes outside the door. And then we try to sort them out and make them available, preserving them and putting them online. So think of the Allen County Public Library as a, a place that might take your family tree and stories that you have about your family. State libraries. My family was in North Dakota. I sent them my book, The Journey. They took it great in their catalog. They were delighted. Um, this is a great story. A neighbor had th these items for her family about um, uh, a family member who was a union veteran during the Civil War. And she had his muster roll. She had pension records. She had a, a, 
a diary he wrote about the Battle of Fredericksburg. Plus he had these uh, medals that he got later in life in tribute to the service that he did. He was from New Jersey. She said, what do I do with these? I, they're disintegrating. I don't know what to do with them. I said, let's get in touch with the New Jersey State Archives and see if they want them. I took pictures of them, sent them off. They were delighted, particularly about this Fredericksburg diary. Now they are in a safe place. They will be preserved. Um, and historians and people who are interested in this gentleman and interested in this period of the Civil War and Fredericksburg can use these materials for their own research. She's sharing this with the world. She's not keeping it in a box in her, um, in her garage, under her bed, wherever. Um, the Library of Congress will also accept donations of self-published family genealogies. Wouldn't that be fun to have your book in the Library of Congress? So these are all things to think about. Now let's get into digital archives, which is another way of getting it out there. Collection Air, I really like. Um, you put your photos in there, you click on uh, the individual in your family, and then there'll be photos, a story, movies, um, audio tapes, everything that's connected to that family or that couple. I think this, it's a beautiful format. The problem is it's a subscription. Are your kids going to want to continue to pay for that subscription? So I'm looking at two other ones, two companies that will also store your documents online, allow you to share them with your family and with the world, but you pay when you upload your files. There's no ongoing subscription. You pay for the real estate before you start to upload your files. So you don't have the subscription issue. Forever claims they'll keep your documents for 100 years. Permanent is a nonprofit, works with museums, historical societies, says it will keep your files forever and it will update your files to the changing technology. Both of these companies say they will keep things for at least 100 years. Um, things change, I don't know, but at least it's a way of getting it out there for the next generation and perhaps a generation after that. Here's the forever site. You might look that out and look that up and see what you think. Here's permanent. I started playing around with this. I started to put my family groups together. And under each of these boxes, I have movies, photos, diaries, things that I want to tell the story of each of these families. Another thing about permanent that I love is that you can link to internet archive particular sections of permanent. Now this, these are pictures of the building of Highway 101 north of Monterey near Prunedale where my family lived. <laughs> Highway 101 went through um, my family's property. These are historical pictures of the building of that highway. Linking to the Internet Archive, which is, um, some of you may have used it, which is a collection of three things. It's a library online of local histories, uh, newspaper articles, books. It's an amazing um, resource for genealogists. Linking to that will allow other people to see this part of history. So permanent.org is speaking to me, I think because it does uh, work with a lot of little libraries. I'm, I'm particularly interested in it. Anyway, check it out and see what you think if a digital archive is something that you want to look at. So if you don't have anyone to whom you might want to pass on your research, create a book and get that book out there. Arrange to share your research and perhaps your book with a library, a museum, historical society. Put your research up in the cloud for your descendants. Sometimes it may skip a generation. That is, your kids may not be interested, but your grandkids may be. So get it up in the cloud in some way, a digital archive or some way. Okay, now let's look at heirlooms and we'll quickly look at this because that's another part of this package. These are all things in my family, a table. This key was in the 1906 earthquake and fire. I'm keeping my grandfather's glasses because I know that now we can have access to DNA through physical things that our ancestors wore. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe I can get my grandfather's DNA off those glasses. This is a chair that my, um, my mother was a little girl sat in. Okay. So the heirlooms, what do we have? Well, we've got furniture and jewelry and china and crystal and silver and pottery, the wedding dress, the baptismal dress, other things and artwork. Okay, so do we need all this? What do we do with this? Let's go back to Marie Kondo. Get rid of the things that have no use 
and the things that don't bring you joy. <laughs> Trash those that you don't want, transfer those that you don't want, and keep those that right now are very precious and useful to you. This is what we don't want. We don't want it all to go in the trash. So let's transfer things. Maybe there's a family member now who would like something. Maybe they've commented on something or you know that it would be really special to them. Give it to them now. So they're enjoying it now. Sell, garage sale, consignment, eBay, you know, all those places that we know. It's a lot of work, but it's a way of moving things on and passing things forward. Donate. That's easy. Goodwill, Salvation Army, and museums, and historical society. And of course, the proverbial garage sale. Okay, keep your precious things, pass on the memory and the story of the other items. And shop box, I just want to throw that out. That's a great way to take pictures of three-dimensional things like a vase or something. It, it, it provides perfect light and you can put your phone, your uh, cell phone in the top and it takes great pictures. So those things that you're passing on, tell the story, take a picture, tell the story. Um, this is a trunk that's in my living room that I love. My family, uh, it was said that it came across the isthmus in 1968, uh, 1868, and came up the coast of California when my family came to San Francisco in 1868. Well, I started to do a little research, and I see that it's not 1868; it's 1880. And I wrote a, a trend, a, a, an antique dealer, and he said, "No, I'm afraid your trunk is more 1880 to 1900s." But nevertheless, it's still nearly 140 years old. I love it, and um, I don't. I want something to, to, to pass that on, that story. So take your, your heirlooms, take an inventory, create a spreadsheet, put a picture or description in an heirloom binder so your kids know what is special about that heirloom. Designate where you want it to go. Have a directive. Who's the person? Where's the place that you want it to go? Keep an inventory. Notice provenance is up there again. That term come, keeps coming up. Make an Excel sheet. That's fine too. So what I do is I take a picture and then I tell a little bit about the history of it. I said that this trunk belonged to Emma Sarah Monroe, 1848 to 1928. All I have left of my great grandmother, Emma Sarah, are her trunk, her name, a few photos and her story. I've written about her in other places and I will attach the story to this as well. Her trunk sits proudly in my living room. This cross slapped barrel top trunk provides small glimpses into her life, still withholding many secrets and unknown tales. Her middle name, Sarah, was passed on down to her granddaughter, my mother, and that name was in turn passed on down to my daughter. So Emma Sarah lives through her name, her trunk, and the bits and pieces left of her story. And then you see at the bottom, I can have a directive uh, for the successor. Uh, the ownership of that item. So um, this gives a little bit of background as family are looking at some of the precious gems. So other things, you might want to do the same thing for jewelry, wedding dress, etc. I have pearl earrings that I love that my parents gave me when I was 21. I'd love for my daughter-in-law or my daughter to have those earrings. I'd like them to know a little bit about the story of those earrings. So this is something, some way you can pass on the story and not, no one will feel like that they need to actually keep the thing. In a trunk that was my grandmother's, I put an envelope which reads Cedar Chest, February 7th, 2019. I share the story of the chest and the items in the chest. I also put this in my binder, my heirloom binder, so that as my family looks at this chest, they'll know why some of these things are important. Think about how you wanna store your items. And again, these archival boxes. Do you have dolls? There may be a, a box that you need to protect those dolls. Maybe there's a very fragile book, photo albums, a family Bible. I have a family Bible that's 150 years old. Definitely needs to be in an archival box. I'm not ready to give that up yet, although I do want to find a home for that because I, I, it, it's too precious, actually. Um, in review, set some realistic goals. Scan your photos and your documents. And that way, maybe you can give away some of these original things. 
create a scrapbook or an album for your family. Um, my husband's father created some wonderful scrapbooks, a story of his life. Self-publish a book. I use Shutterfly a lot. It's really easy to use. Create flash drives. Get those out to your family with the things that you want to share with them. Work on a binder or a digital summary of heirlooms. And identify, start to think about the museums that might want your research or heirlooms. We have a, a wonderful historical society here in, in Monterey that has a lot of, it's actually a museum as well as archival um, repository. And I'm thinking the trunk would be a good place for that museum to go to if my uh, children don't want that because it's honoring Monterey, Monterey County and my family did live in Monterey. Um, then write up a summary, describe your legacy, briefly describe your collection. Um, what do you have in it? Um, where your documents and papers and how they're organized. Share how and where your original photos and digital prints are organized. Explain how your genealogy software, just briefly how it works, or at least that you even have it. Let them know you have it. Share where your computer files are backed up. By the way, if you're not doing that, you should be doing that somewhere because those of us that have been in fire situations you can't always get home to get your computer. You know, you want it backed up so that if you're not there and you do lose it, you want those things somewhere. Include your passwords to the genealogy sites, to the backup sites, because then your family may need to access those, those, those subscriptions. Explain how your heirloom binder or the file works. Summarize and list the contents of your archival boxes. Now I'm speaking like a librarian, but um, this way you're giving respect and honor to those things that are in those boxes. So where do you want it to go? Well, just like we do estate planning on other parts of our life, this is something that we is really precious to us that we've worked, many of us have worked many years on and these heirlooms are important to us. So think about a directive, put your instructions in writing, share where you want your research to go. Is there a family member that would care for you? That's perfect. There's somebody that would like your research and has been working with you. That's perfect. If not, maybe there's a repository where you might like your research to be shipped and just line that up so that people will know where to send these things. A repository might be better able to handle your research if it's boxed up and ready to go, if it's organized and it's not put in a box outside the door of the Allen um, County um, Genealogy Center. And also just another thought is you might have your heirlooms appraised. You don't want any problems with that. So that's something to do. And um, another time when I talked to a group about this, someone said, go to, a historical society and see who they use as an appraiser. I thought that was a great idea. So maybe the Napa Historical Society might have some recommendations. Lisa Louise Cook, who is a wonderful podcaster, has a genealogical materials directive. You can actually just research this online and, and you can download it. And that's a very easy way to uh, create a, a quick directive. So finally, don't be overwhelmed. Just take it step by step. Remember, whatever you do will be better than when you started. Start with an easy project. I, I wasn't easy, but I did photos during COVID. I um, did a lot of scanning of photos and that was very satisfying to get a lot of that done. Congratulate yourself on what you've accomplished. Remember you're doing this for your family, for your descendants and your ancestors and yourself. And I want to finish just with Max Paxton. I don't know if any of you have watched this or have seen it, um, but he's on PBS. I'm going to see if I can just show you just a little bit of this. He is a, a move strategist. He goes into homes, people who are downsizing, and helps them honor their heirlooms. Oh, yeah. When he came into town, uh, he made a point of stopping by and saying hi to my, my grandfather. Do you know who that is? Oh, yeah. That's Woody Herman. Uh, Woody Herman was big in that era and got bigger in the 50s. He's writing, uh, thanks for making, making visits. Our visits a, a pleasure. So a pleasure, yeah. 
So the goal is to put it somewhere where people can appreciate it. And enjoy it and so that we'll carry on. So here's the good news. I know the goal was to get it to some cool places, all right? With all the pictures, we actually spoke to the Oakmont Historical Society. Oh, okay. They want it bad. They <laughs> really, really want it. They want pretty much anything that you're willing to give them for pop. Aww. They're interested, okay? That's so great. This history is really amazing, and it's well-preserved. And here's the kicker. There's somebody that wants to tell that story. Oh, yeah. Right? And because your grandpa is attached to it, that's why they want it. So 60, almost 70 years, the guy's been dead, and I didn't have to explain who he was. Yeah. The answer was yes. <laughs> so basically, Max Paxton, this might be something you might want to watch on PBS or, or channel. He goes in and he finds places for families, and his show is called Legacy List. And I think I think it's fun to hear the stories of families and the places they found to pass their things on. He's also written a book, uh, Memories, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff, Declutter, Downsize, and Move Forward with Your Life. So he's someone that you might check out. So it's all about creating and sharing your legacy with your family, and not only with your family, with the world. Whatever you do will be something. And getting rid of some of the clutter will free you up for your next chapter. So I hope I've given you some ideas um, just in places to start to think about. It is a big job. It is. It can be overwhelming. But if we can just start thinking about it now, we're curating and creating a story for our descendants and we're passing it on. So I'm going to unshare and see if there are any questions or things people want to share. Wow. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was very, very informative. I learned so much and I'm definitely going to go back and watch the video myself on the library's YouTube channel so that I can uh, remember some of the things that you suggested because those were all really, really great, really great lessons. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a few comments and questions. So I'm just going to start from the beginning. Um, Alan Winter asked, so I think he's talking about the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, the Allen Center. Don't the Mormons convert people after they've died? Do you know anything about that? Oh, well, I, um, I, I, I can't speak for, as a member of the church, but I do know that they really honor um, family history and they do not try and convert in their family history centers. Many of us have used their family history centers. They are so helpful um, and their resources are so wonderful. So I have had a lot of contact with our family history center, a lot of contact with the family history library in Salt Lake. I've been back there a number of times and I've just benefited so much from uh, the research that they've done. So no, I would say no, that is not part of, of sharing the research. The conversion is not. Okay, thank you. Um, Barbara Ryan had a comment. Allen, Allen County does not take artifacts, things, China, furniture, et cetera, but they will take any research. That's so correct. They do, not take, they do not take heirlooms or artifacts. It would be family research. They, will, um, they do have a wonderful website where they, they actually post digitized pages from Bibles. So you might all check that out because maybe your family Bible is in there collection um but yes i and they are they have great um classes that they offer as well so check out their website okay that's a good idea uh sue from the genealogical society asked can family members access permanent.org and forever.com yes yes um you give them the links and it's free uh you paid for it already and they have all kinds of access and you can actually include someone as a collaborator with you and that would be part of your what you have the subscription or what you've paid for up front and Great. i love this idea of being able to connect with internet archive and also you can connect with uh, family search as well um, family search is such a big um, institution in this whole genealogy thing that you have to really look at it as um and a major contributor that is also free. We do have a family search database on the library's website, which you can access. It is free, even if you um, access it from home, you know, on their own website. But if you enter your library card number, um, you can you know, access it from home through our website, 
or um, on our computers at the library. And, Barbara and that's Ryan. a special, and, and Tess, I believe that's a special um, arrangement that you have where you have actually more uh, opportunities for databases than we do with our subscription at home. Right. So that's something to check out with the Napa County Library and with your Family History Center. And I don't know if, um, anyway, that is definitely uh, an advantage. That's great that you have that. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Uh, Barbara Ryan had a comment. She loves Legacy List. So that's a new show oh. we're going to have to check out. <laughs> it's a kick. It's a kick. And, and Matt is, is, is very funny. So if you need a good laugh and, and you're, you know, you're working on decluttering your house and you need a good laugh, check on Matt and Logan's okay. legacy. Good. List. <laughs> um, let's see. C. Lee Colley said, fantastic. I took six pages of notes. Wow. That's impressive. Hey, C. Lee, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Um, Bob Saxby says, Kathy, your presentation was exceptionally well organized and very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice compliment. Um, B. Bood asked, great talk. Where's the Allen County Public Library? Thank you. It's in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It is the second largest genealogical library in the country, perhaps in the world. Family uh, History Library is the largest in the world. Wow. But I did not know that. Yeah, and often, often genealogy society um, conferences are held in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana because of the Allen County Library. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, C. Lee also asked, uh, those services like Forever and Permanent that have you pay up front, how do they charge by gigabytes or something like that? Say that again. How do they charge? By... How do they charge for uh, the storage on Forever and Permanent? Is it by speed? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, they pay charge by gigabyte. Gigabyte. And I believe it's fifteen dollars or ten dollars a gigabyte. Um, so, uh, you know, it is it is an investment, um, but it is not something you have to pay every month. Right. Which I really like that option. Yeah. Um, and then Bob Saxby asked, Kathy, what will be your first three steps as you tackle your collection? I would think the first thing is to organize your paper documents. Get those in some kind of organization that tell a story, whether it be in a folder or a binder, but put the things that are related together. And I do that by couple, so that I chronologically arrange by couple the birth marriage, uh, death, and anything in between. Uh, and that tells a story just by being in a binder right there. It's chronological, it's by couple. You can do this with an individual as well. So you've got that squared away. Then look at what you want to scan. Well, actually the first thing is you just have to decide what you wanna keep and what you're gonna scan and what you're gonna throw out. I should go back a little ways. Then put your things you're gonna keep in some format, chronological format, then decide what you're gonna scan and what you're gonna get rid of. Um, and just focus on telling a story so it will make sense to whoever picks it up and sees it. And they'll say, oh, this is amazing. I can see my great grandparents. I can see the story through their marriage certificate and through the children that were born and their deeds, what land they lived on and their occupations. They already have a sense of the story, even if you haven't written it up. I hope I really that love that theme that you had throughout of, of really telling a story. I think that everyone can connect to that. And especially as a librarian myself too, that's what we're always trying to do and facilitate for others. And so I really love that, that idea of telling a story through your family heirlooms and, and documents. So, um, you, you know, what I, what I want to add one thing. Yeah. We look at, um, you know, it's kind of like a hanger and we put uh, the hanger is our family tree with all of the names and dates and places. And then we put the story on the hanger to flesh it out, to make it interesting, because it's the story that helps us connect with our family. They're not interested in the birth, marriage and death dates so much. They're interested in the story of their lives. And I know when I was studying history, I always was interested in the, the, the every man, the little man, what his story was. We were busy here reading about the famous people. Genealogy gives us a chance to honor the little man and tell his story. 
and our family story. Right. I love that. I really love that. So uh, I just want to say a few words at the end for everyone that has stuck around. Thank you. Uh, about Napa County Library's new memory lab. I'm going to share my screen real quick just so you can see. Let's see, share. You can see uh, this is the page on the Napa County Library website that is about the memory lab. So it is a free do it yourself space for making highly digital, highly quality digitized personal archive collections. So we have professional grade equipment. Library patrons can digitize multiple formats. So what you can digitize, documents, photos, slides, negatives, three and a half inch floppy disks. And soon you'll be able to digitize VHS and VHS C tapes, which is really exciting. So you, it is by appointment only. So you can make an appointment using this link from our website, uh, memorylab.eventbrite.com. Uh, you can also give us a call at the reference line, 707-253-4235, and we can uh, direct you to that uh, what place to make an appointment. And we please ask that you come with your items in a USB storage device or external hard drive with you prepared so that you will be ready to digitize. So this is really exciting. You probably saw this in the Napa Valley Register recently. That was an article that we had about uh, the new memory lab. And we hope to see you soon at the library uh, preserving your memories. So I want to say thank you again to Kathy very much for that presentation. So informative. Thank you to Mark and Sally and Sue from the Napa Valley Genealogical Society. And thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. And uh, we'll see you soon at the library. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.